My name is Jason Aramburu, and I'm the founder of Eden. Yeah, I guess my first, you know, real experience with entrepreneurship, or, or first big experience, was Ed Shao's class at Princeton, and it was really influential to me. It taught me that, you know, anyone could be an entrepreneur. You you didn't have to have all the details figured out, and that, um, you know, interest and persistence were were really important. And um, you know, I, I didn't start ReachR immediately after college. It was about a year or so after graduation that I started the company, but I didn't have a lot of startup experience, and so Ed actually helped me to get a job at a startup right out of college in New York. And that job at that tech startup was, uh, you know, it, it taught me a lot about how companies are built. You know, it taught me what, what, what to do well, what to do right, and, and also taught me a lot of what, what I shouldn't do in a startup? Uh, well, without getting into too many details, um, it was a software startup and the technical team was divided between New York City and then the bulk of the engineers were in um, actually South America, in Argentina. And I realized that's not something that you should do. If, if you can, you should have everybody in the same room working together. I'd always been interested in agriculture. Um, I was an EEB major and I focused on soil science and I did the Panama program at Princeton. So I went and spent uh, my spring semester, junior year in Panama, working at the Smithsonian. And that's where I first learned about um, indigenous technologies. So ReChar, what, we, what the company produces is a product called Biochar. And Biochar is a charcoal-based soil amendment. It's uh, kind of like a replacement for fertilizer, but it's made from charcoal. And it's a technique that farmers in the Amazon and in Central America have been using for thousands of years. And it's a very low-cost fertilization technique. And I thought it was really interesting. And I also learned that it has a lot of climate benefits as well. Uh, by using charcoal in the soil, you're actually helping to offset atmospheric carbon. And so I, I learned about this when I was down there from the community of scientists and thought, this is really cool. I want to someday do something with biochar. But uh, I, didn't, I didn't really know, you know what that would be until, until after graduation. We sold quite a few of them in the US, but we, I'm still figuring out a long-term production partner in the US because uh -huh. it's kind of, the, I found the demand is really seasonal in the US. Um, you know, people tend to want this product in the spring. And so having a full-time manufacturing line in the U.S. for the kilns doesn't really make sense at this point. But um, soon, we're going to publish plans for people to build them who want to build them. Um, I would say, you know, as a social entrepreneur, um, it is more difficult to get funding than as a traditional entrepreneur or a traditional, you know, I, I do think that all entrepreneurs in the future will be social entrepreneurs and will have to be. But I think it is more difficult because... Many times, social entrepreneurs work in developing countries where there's a lot of risk. Um, they are often selling products to people you know, uh, who live at or below poverty. And so it can be challenging to, uh, uh, to find the right funders. And you know, typically, most uh, venture capitalists and investors, you know, they want to see the quick path to profit and return, and oftentimes, that just doesn't work with a social entrepreneurship business plan. So, you know, there's, there's really two options, I think, for, uh, for social entrepreneurs. Uh, there's a class of investor called an impact investor, and it's still a really small asset class, but these are private for-profit investors who also want a blended return. They want a, a social or an environmental return in addition to a financial return on their investment. And, uh, you know, there are a number of impact investors out there, but it's, it pales in comparison to the size of the traditional venture capital market. The other option, which, and with ReachR, we, we really had difficulty infiltrating the impact investor market, but where we had great success was on the grant funding side. Um, we were able to secure grant funding from a lot of different groups. A group called Echoing Green in, the, in New York was our first funder, and then we got funding as well from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And um, that funding was critical because, you know, when you are building a business in the developing world, you're not just 
like building the production, you're not just building the, the production channels and the marketing channels, you're basically building the whole economy. You know, you're often going into a place where the economy does not exist. And so you have to invest a lot in just getting the tools and the channels to sell and distribute your product. The one unifying uh, marketing channel in a place like Kenya is the, the phone. And so we had great success with actually text message based advertising. There's no you know, internet ads, their TV ads are not really effective because most people don't have TVs. Um, a lot of people have radios, but, uh, but really where we had the most effective penetration was just recruiting leaders, community leaders, farmers, to be kind of ambassadors and salespeople for ReCharge. That, that was our, by far our most effective uh, marketing technique. When I was picking the core team for the company, I... You know, I wanted it, first of all, to be heavily local. So I, I felt like as a foreigner, you know, I needed to build a local team of keep people who grew up in Kenya who know the environment and can relate to the customer base. So that was critical. But beyond that, you know, we did, we did, uh, did and, and do have a few expats on staff. And um, I would say in, when selecting, you know, foreigners, expats, I looked for a couple things. Um, number one was just experience working in a developing country because I think it takes a certain type of person you know um, over there for instance uh, there's not running water every day sometimes you have to take a shower with a tea kettle and um, there's not you know there's power outages there's not fast internet so it takes you know you have to be comfortable in that environment first of all um, I would say high maintenance people generally do not do well there <laughs> So that was kind of the first thing. So, you know, what, like, for instance, one of our early employees, um, he did Princeton in Africa right after Princeton. So he had that experience. Uh, another guy was, um, he was in the military, actually. So he had a lot of experience working in developing countries. So that was, you know, that was first and foremost important. I would say the second quality was... Um, you know, just uh, resilience and ingenuity, the ability to think quickly on your feet, you know, sometimes things don't go as planned running a business, particularly if you're running a business in a place like Kenya. Um, so I think, you know, th those two qualities were really critical. And then after that, you know, obviously hard skills specific to the job are really critical. But um, overall, just, just the ability to function in the developing world context and to really... Um, engross yourself in it and, uh, and be part of the community. Without getting into too much detail, by far the toughest challenge I faced as an entrepreneur, um, you know, I've always enjoyed working with friends or friends of friends. I find it's the most, one of the most effective ways to build a company, but it is very difficult when you have to fire a friend. <laughs> Eden is different from Rechar in that it's, um, you know, it's more of a domestic, uh, you know, developed world product. Uh, we're selling through retail channels, big box retail channels, and through the web. There's also a social aspect to it, an environmental aspect to it. But, um, you know, we're, we're creating, it's much more of a high-tech company. You know, it's, um, it's an engineering-focused company. So this is one of the Eden sensors right here. It's a wireless uh, digital soil sensor for agriculture and gardening that measures the soil's moisture and fertility and uh, sends all that information to your iPhone. So you can pull up the iPhone app. So you know it allows a, a farmer or a gardener to view in real time kind of what's going on in their garden and what uh, uh, where you know when they need to irrigate, when they need to add fertilizer, that sort of thing. And the culture we're trying to create is, uh, is one, you know, different from the traditional Silicon Valley tech culture. You know, we're obviously more about the environment and about food and health. Um, but, you know, we're also very laid back. I mean, the office is pretty relaxed. We've got a bunch of plants in the office. Um, my dog is on the floor over there. So very laid back. And, um, you know, we just, we just want to create a culture uh, of innovation and find people who are really, really excited to change how the world grows food. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, and uh, here's, here's actually 
uh, Paul Cowgill, 08, in the background, who's our VP Software Engineering. He was Princeton 08, and he also took Ed's class. So, <laughs> the culture at Eden, you know, we're creating a company culture that is um, laid back and focuses on innovation, as an, but you know, also innovation with a social and environmental benefit. So, you know, we're not trying to create the next Facebook or Instagram necessarily. We're trying to create something that can meaningfully impact how people grow food and how we use our resources in, in the in the world. Mentors have been really important. Um, you know, I would say Ed Shao has been a great mentor. I've, I've really kept in touch with him since graduation, and he's really, you know, provided advice at, at all different stages. Uh, I think mentors are invaluable, and in our case, also, a lot, of, a lot of our mentors have gone on to become investors in the company. I don't know if I could distill it down to one specific set of advice, but I think broadly the most important piece of advice I've learned from mentors has been you know don't try to go it alone um, if there's a problem that you're having trouble solving find someone who's done it before or who's been there who can you know who can help you um, you know it, it definitely takes a village to build a company I've definitely had to learn new skills with the new company um, you know we're Rechar was we produce very heavy products you know bulky fertilizer products and it was um, using a chemical and a heat-based process. So it was, I would say, much more industrial. Eden is much more of a consumer electronics product. And so, you know, I've, um, I've had to learn a couple things. I mean, I, I, I did a lot, uh, a lot of software work at Princeton on statistics in the EEB department. So, you know, I knew some basics around coding, but I've really had to learn a lot, uh, a lot there about programming and CS, as well as all aspects of manufacturing a consumer electronics product. It's, um, you know, it, there's really quite a lot to it and it's a, you know, it's a process. But there, again, uh, the best way I've tackled that is just by finding mentors and people who've done it before. Mm. Oh, no, I, I don't have any regrets. I, I um, can't really imagine having done it another way. I think if I had done anything else, I probably would have regrets, and I, you know, wish I had had started a company. Um, you know, the, uh, yesterday we had um, a guy in our office who is a salesman for a chip manufacturer where we're considering using this particular chip, and he was just like, "Wow, I, you know, I wish I'd done what you guys are doing when I was your age. I wish I'd started a company." If I had one piece of advice for a uh, Princeton undergrad with entrepreneurial ambitions, I would say. Find, a, find something that, you know, you're really interested in and really passionate about, whatever it may be. And don't, don't worry if the whole world doesn't see it yet, you know. Just focus on something that you love and you're fascinated by because starting a company is really hard. It's, it's the hardest thing you can possibly do. And, um, you know, it's in those difficult times, it's really your personal passion that, that keeps you afloat and keeps you going. If I had known I was going to be an entrepreneur, I, you know, probably would have taken maybe some more uh, business or finance classes or econ classes just to get kind of, you know, I, my curriculum was very science heavy and, you know, tech heavy. I probably would have taken some, some econ classes just to get a basic understanding of that because once I started my first company, I really had to kind of learn um, accounting and bookkeeping and all that stuff and, you know. It's, it's not hard to learn, but it would have been great to learn that at Princeton. I just didn't, didn't think about it. I probably would have taken more risks at Princeton also. Um, you know, looking back on it, I kind of, I wish I had done a full year abroad instead of one semester. Um, and I, you know, I wish I'd, I always wish I'd taken, you know, different crazier classes and that sort of thing. I wish I had taken more philosophy classes, actually. I wish I had taken more philosophy classes. I took one, I think, just kind of an intro class. But um, I think, you know, philosophy is, is a field that can really impact your life long after you're at Princeton, having a basic understanding. So I wish, I wish I'd done that. My name is Jason Aramburu, and I'm a Princeton entrepreneur.